The story begins with a young boy named Haruto was bidding farewell to his childhood friend, Miyaru, as he went on a journey. Miyaru couldn't help but shed tears, pleading for him to stay. In a sudden flashback, Haruto, or rather Haruto, reminisces about riding a bus. Tragically, the bus collides with a train, and Haruto and the other passengers meet a tragic fate. As he regains consciousness, Haruto finds himself in the body of a malnourished boy named Ryo. His memories are a jumbled mix, leaving him uncertain if he's still Haruto from Japan or this wretched-looking boy, Ryo. Confused and wondering if it's just a feverish dream, he encounters a group of men in the room who call him Ryo. They selfishly enjoy their food, ignoring the starving Ryo and complaining about his odor. Ignoring their taunts, Ryo focuses on finding food and discovers berries in the bushes. Memories of being a 20-year-old student from Japan resurface, but Ryo knows he must embrace his current identity as a poor boy in Beltran. His mission to avenge his mother's murder drives him forward, remembering their humble life as immigrants with dark hair. In the slums, Ryo encounters four people in white robes looking for a girl with purple hair. Among them is Celia, a white-haired girl who politely questions him. Though he hasn't seen the girl, Celia senses Ryo's strong magical powers and thanks him with a bag of coins before leaving. Back at the house, Ryo is attacked by a masked man. Fortunately, the bag of coins protects him, but as he prepares to retaliate, time stops, and a pink-haired girl appears in an ethereal projection. She teaches him how to use magic, and Ryo combines this newfound power with memories of martial arts from Haruto, knocking out the masked man. Investigating the noises, Ryo finds a purple-haired girl in a bag. She asks him to take her to the royal castle but faints upon seeing the unconscious kidnapper. Ryo agrees and heads towards the castle, but the people from earlier mistake him for a kidnapper, leading to his interrogation. In the house where Ryo was attacked, royal guards inspect the scene, finding the masked man conscious. A mysterious hooded man intervenes, causing the suspect's demise. In the castle dungeon, Charles, the vice captain of the knights, tortures Ryo, accusing him of kidnapping the princess. Ryo maintains his innocence. The purple-haired girl, Princess Flora, wakes up in her room, and Celia and Vanessa fill her in on the events. Convinced of Ryo's innocence, she requests to see him in the dungeon. Celia and Vanessa are shocked at Charles' brutality towards Ryo, and Flora uses her magical abilities to set him free. Ryo passes out but later awakens in a palace room where Celia apologizes for the guard's actions. The king and queen thank him for saving Princess Flora. As a gesture of gratitude, Ryo is offered admission to the prestigious Beltran Royal Academy, which he gladly accepts. However, Ryo feels out of place among the noble students due to his commoner background. Seeking help, he turns to Celia, a teacher at the academy, and asks her to teach him how to read and write. Despite her young age, Celia is exceptionally brilliant and assists Ryo with his studies. In the midst of tutoring, Celia notices that Ryo excels in assignments, and she reveals that Princess Christina is the only other classmate with the same level of accuracy. To help Ryo improve, Celia suggests some children's novels for him to read. During combat lessons and sword fighting, Ryo's martial arts knowledge from his past life as Haruto shines through, impressing the instructor who offers him a spot in the Royal Knights. Ryo politely declines, choosing to focus on his new life. Five years pass, and Ryo is selected to represent the Beltran Royal Academy in a tournament against the Royal Guards. However, another student named Alphonse is unhappy with the choice, belittling Ryo due to his peasant background. Despite such treatment, Ryo remains determined and continues to make tremendous progress at the Academy. One day, Ryo helps Celia in the library, and she praises his growth. They share a light-hearted moment, teasing each other about their appearances. Ryo confides in Celia about his desire to travel to his parents' homeland in the Iguma region after graduation. Feeling ostracized by his peers, he longs to discover his roots and embark on a new journey. The exhibition tournament between the Beltran Royal Academy and the Royal Guards begins, with Ryo facing Charles, the vice-captain who had tormented him five years ago. Ryo remains unfazed by Charles' attempts to intimidate him and faces him with determination for revenge. In the intense duel, Ryo counters Charles' attacks and emerges victorious, leaving Charles disappointed. After the match, Charles confides in an ominous blue-haired man, the ambassador from the Praxia Empire. The ambassador takes an interest when he learns of Ryo's involvement in the incident with Princess Flora five years ago. This ambassador is the same hooded figure who had crushed the Red Crystal, leading to the demise of the masked assailant. In another class, Celia teaches about magic, and the students attempt to cast a spell to create a sphere of light. Ryo faces ridicule from other royal students when he struggles with the same type of magic they use. However, Ryo possesses a unique and special kind of magic different from theirs. He chooses to keep this ability hidden to avoid unnecessary attention. In the days following the incident in the forest, Ryo is nowhere to be found, and he is believed to be missing at the school. Celia overhears Duke Stewart's father announcing publicly that Ryo pushed Princess Flora off the cliff, even though he knows it was actually Stewart who did it. Later, Ryo discreetly visits Celia in her lab, and she's relieved to see that he's okay. She informs him about the Duke's plot and is furious about it, but Ryo remains unfaced and believes that nobody would believe him. 
To avoid further problems, he decides to travel to the Iguma region, where his ancestors lived, and promises to meet Celia again in the future. After saying his goodbyes, Ryo embarks on his journey. After traveling for three days, Ryo arrives in the kingdom of Galark and reaches a market town to get some food. Unbeknownst to him, someone is following him. Once he's done buying food and condiments, he continues his journey through the forest. There, he encounters an unconscious beast girl. When she wakes up, she tries to spit a poison spike at him, but Ryo kicks her away and realizes that she has animal ears, making her a beast girl. Using his magic, he neutralizes the poison. The beast girl, named Latifa, declares that she wants to kill him and attacks him with her knives, but Ryo manages to subdue her and calm her down with a spell. Ryo notices a collar of submission on Latifa's neck and quickly removes it using a magic spell he learned from a book. Through a flashback, it is revealed that Latifa died in the same train accident as Haruto and got reincarnated as a beast girl in the fantasy world. She was captured by the Huguenot family and mistreated by Stuart Daly. After Ryo removes the collar, Latifa thanks him with tears of joy. She doesn't know much about her master, but Ryo quickly connects the dots and realizes that Stuart from the Royal Academy is the same Stuart who mistreated her. Latifa promises not to try to kill Ryo anymore, and he sets her free from her restraints. She asks to follow him on his journey as they both head east, leading to a place called the Wilderness, where beast people and demi-humans live together in peace. Ryo agrees, and they continue their journey together, facing dangerous adventures along the way. One night, Latifa starts talking in her sleep about her parents in Tokyo, and Ryo realizes that she died in the same accident as him. However, he chooses not to reveal this fact to her. Some nights later, when Latifa has a nightmare, Ryo calms her down with a magic spell. He notices the fire outside their camp suddenly goes out, and he sees a large wolf that disappears into a blinding ray of light. Three demi-humans surround their hut and mistake Ryo for kidnapping Latifa, leading to an attack that renders him unconscious. Ryo eventually wakes up tied to a bed by the demi-humans. Latifa wakes up too and rushes to check on him. Realizing their mistake, the demi-human girls apologize and remove his restraints. Ursula, among them, also apologizes and invites him to stay in the room to recover. The next morning, Ryo finds himself in the village where the demi-humans took him. Ursula, the leader, shows him around, taking him to the ward tree, where Dryas, the spirit of mighty trees, resides. Then, they meet Dominic, a dwarf, and Sildora, an elf, in a conference room. The elders apologize for the misunderstanding and thank Ryo for saving Latifa from slavery. As a gesture of gratitude, they ask what he would like in exchange. Ryo requests to stay in the village and learn about spirit arts and traditions. The elders happily accept his requests. Later, they encounter a green-haired girl named Dryas, the spirit of the world tree, who senses Ryo's spirit inside him. She presumes that he made a contract with a spirit, although Ryo doesn't remember anything of the sort. Dryas confirms his immense magical energy and tells him there's a spirit sleeping inside him. Ryo is then taken to a house where Latifa and the other demi-human girls are waiting for him. They all have dinner together, and Ryo and Latifa are informed they'll be staying with Sarah, Orphea, and Alma. In the meantime, Ryo learns the spirit arts and combat from the people in the village while getting acquainted with them and helping with daily tasks. Elsewhere, the ambassador from Proxia, Reese, rides a griffin with a blonde-haired young man to the entrance of a cave. Reese goes into the cave while the young man waits outside. After a while, Reese emerges with a huge wyvern egg and hands it to the young man. They continue their journey with the egg. A year passes since Ryo settled in the forest village, and a feast is prepared for the Grand Spirit Festival night. Ryo and the villagers enjoy the feast and have fun together. Meanwhile, Reese and the young man arrive in a forest to rest for the night. Reese gives the man a red pill, promising that if he swallows it, they'll know his location at all times. The young man swallows it without hesitation, and Reese leaves to inspect the area, leaving him to watch over the egg. Back in the forest village, Ryo takes Latifa for a stroll in the forest. During their time together, he confides in her that his stay in the village is coming to an end, and he intends to continue his journey to the land of his ancestors. He expresses concern for the danger ahead and hesitates to let her follow him, not wanting to put her in harm's way. However, Latifa becomes upset, expressing her desire to be with him. Meanwhile, in the village, the elders call for a meeting as they sense a large swarm of wyverns heading in their direction. In the wyvern cave, Reese steals the remaining eggs and transports them elsewhere. The demi-humans spot the blonde boy in the forest and decide to investigate. He becomes intimidated and flees on a griffin, but the wyverns start chasing after him, heading toward the village. In the cave, Reese crushes a red stone similar to the one the young boy swallowed earlier, causing the boy to die in midair. Observing the situation, Sarah summons a spirit wolf, and Alma rides it to confront the wyverns. In the meantime, heartbroken Latifa wanders through the forest and encounters the wyvern egg dropped by the young man, which breaks before her. The largest wyvern appears, and in a fit of rage, it tries to kill Latifa with a massive fireball. Alma comes to her rescue, summoning a large lion spirit, but even their combined efforts fail to defeat the wyvern. 
Latifa gets trapped, but just as the wyvern is about to attack, Rio appears and saves her, flying her to safety. As the situation unfolds, Rio and Latifa find themselves in the midst of a perilous and unpredictable journey, where danger, spirits, and powerful forces converge. Their bonds with each other and the spirits they encounter will play a crucial role in determining their fate as they face new challenges and continue to uncover the mysteries of this fantasy world. Ryo, using his enhanced powers, takes on the wyvern in a fierce battle, countering its fiery attack with a powerful energy ball, ultimately defeating it. The other wyverns retreat, leaving the demi-humans astonished at Ryo's prowess. The next day, Latifa finally accepts Ryo's departure and reveals that she was once a human from Japan who died and reincarnated into this fantasy world. Ryo acknowledges his own reincarnation and bids farewell to the elders and villagers who gift him various items, including a mithril sword, armor made from wyvern skin, potions, medicines, food, and a magical storage device. Two weeks after arriving in the Iguma region, Ryo still hasn't found any information about his parents. He arrives in the village of Karasuki, where he meets Chief Yuba, who turns out to be his grandmother. Yuba confirms that Ryo's parents, Zen and Ayam, had left the village years ago for reasons she can't disclose yet, and asks him to stay until she's ready to reveal more. Ryo agrees and discovers that both Yuba and his cousin Ruri can also use spirit magic. Over time, Ryo helps with chores and becomes popular among the villagers. He accompanies Ruri's friend Sio and her brother Shin for hunting in the forest. While Shin struggles to catch anything, Ryo displays incredible talent as a hunter, which triggers Shin's jealousy. Despite this, Ryo continues to assist the villagers and becomes well-liked. Yuba asks Ryo for a favor to escort traders traveling to the royal capital to sell rice. While agreeing to help, they overhear a heated argument between Shin and an arrogant man named Gon. Gon, the son of the leader, demands to stay at Yuba's house while his cart is being repaired for transporting goods to the capital. During a heated argument, God boldly proclaims that one day he will marry Ruri, considering she's Yuba's only heir. This statement angers Shin, who impulsively attacks Gon with a punch. Unfortunately, Shin's efforts are in vain as he is swiftly overpowered and choked by the bigger man. Yuba intervenes and stops the one-sided fight, assuming it was a misunderstanding. She allows Gon to stay in a guest house until his cart is fixed, to keep him away from Ruri's potential harm. She also lets Sio stay in her house. Later that night, Ryo meets with Ruri and gives her a redstone amulet, explaining that it will protect her. In the guest house, Gon spends time with his slacker friends, drinking and chatting. They reveal that they intentionally broke the cart to have an excuse to stay in Karakusi village while plotting something wicked. The following day, a kind man named Hayat arrives on a horse. He introduces himself as a tax examiner and, with his helpers, inspects the villagers' crops. Yuba hosts him for dinner that night. However, Gon sneaks into Ruri and Sio's room while they are asleep, attempting to carry out his nefarious plan. Ryo arrives in time to prevent it, as the amulet he gave Ruri allowed him to sense Gon's presence. Ryo confronts Gon and severely beats him, driven not only by the invasion of the girl's room but also by reminding him of the man who killed his mother. Hayat arrives to heal Gon's injuries and promises to take him to a prison camp the next day. Lost in thought, Ryo realizes he has forgotten about his mission to avenge his mother due to the blending of Haruto's memories and personality with his own. The next day, he apologizes for his violent behavior, and everyone thanks him for saving the vulnerable girls. As promised, Hayat takes Gon and his companions to the prison camp. Yuba gives him a letter to deliver to his father, Lord Juki. Meanwhile, Shin, Dola, Sio, and Ryo embark on their journey to the royal capital to sell their rice. Upon arriving in the capital, they find a place to stay, while Dola, Shin, and Ryo go to a restaurant for drinks. Afterward, Shin personally thanks Ryo for rescuing his sister from Gon. Shin decides to take Sio to the market and buys her a hair decoration as a thank you gift. This kind gesture leads Sio to realize her growing feelings for Ryo, making her question if she's falling in love with him. Meanwhile, Hayat delivers Yuba's letter to Lord Juki, which surprises him greatly. He invites Ryo to his house, where he reveals that he and his wife Kyoko once served as attendants to Ryo's mother, Ayam, who was once the daughter of the royal family of Karasuki. Twenty years ago, during the war with the Rakuren Kingdom, Zen, Ryo's father, served as a soldier in the Karasuki army. His exceptional sword fighting and combat skills caught the attention of Lord Bucky, who suggested him to become a guard for the Karasuki royal family. After joining the royal guards, Zen's love story with Ayam began to blossom. At that time, the Karasuki kingdom initiated a peace treaty with the Roquan kingdom, aiming to bring an end to the long-standing conflict between the two nations. During the signing of the peace treaty, the prince of the Rokuren kingdom became captivated by Ayam and ordered his attendant to kidnap her. Zen, however, intervened just in time to save Ayam by knocking out the prince. Tragically, the attack accidentally resulted in the prince's death. News of the prince's death reached the Rokuren kingdom, infuriating their ruler. He ordered that Zen be executed immediately and demanded Ayam's hand in marriage as the sole condition for maintaining peace between the two nations. 
With no other option, Zen and Iam had to flee the kingdom together. Ryo, listening to the story told by King Juki, found himself astonished to learn that the king and queen were his grandparents. The following day, he visited the royal palace to meet them and introduced himself. During the meeting, Ryo recounted the heart-wrenching tale of how his mother Iam was brutally murdered by a red-haired adventurer named Lucius. He remembered his early childhood and how Lucius had once been helpful to them after his father's death. However, one day, Lucius suddenly attacked Ryo and forced him to drink a mysterious potion. Iam bravely intervened to save her son but tragically lost her life at the hands of Lucius, who wore a sinister expression throughout the ordeal. This event completely changed Ryo's life, leaving him in the slums until he eventually encountered Princess Flora. With a determination to avenge his mother, Ryo is supported by King Hamura to prepare for his quest. As part of his preparation, Ryo is tasked to spar with Duki, Karasuki's strongest warrior. The intense duel initially appears to be evenly matched, but when King Hamura increases the stakes, Ryo surprises everyone with his clever water spell that counters Duki's powerful attack, leading to his victory. Impressed by Ryo's display, King Hamura concludes that no further training is required. Ryo returns to the small village, revealing to Ruri that they are cousins and that he is a prince of the Karasuki kingdom. He shares his plan to leave the village in a year to return to the land where he grew up, but in the meantime, he cherishes spending more time with them and the villagers. Over the next six months, Ryo continues to assist the villagers with various tasks. One day, while planting rice on the farm, Ryo opens up to Sio about his upcoming journey. She confesses her love to him, but Ryo believes they cannot be together as he must leave the village soon. Sio breaks down in tears, trying to hide her emotions until Ruri interrupts them. Ryo realizes the impact of his decision on their hearts but remains firm in his resolve. As time passes, Ryo practices his spirit arts daily, growing stronger with each passing day. When he feels more confident, Sio takes him into the forest for a private conversation. She once again expresses her love for him, but Ryo gently explains that their paths are not aligned, as he has to embark on his journey soon. Once again, Ryo finds himself breaking another heart as Sio immediately starts crying upon learning that he is leaving the village. Ruri interrupts them, making Ryo feel the weight of the emotions in the room. Over the next six months, Sio dedicates herself to practicing her spirit arts daily, hoping to grow stronger and join Ryo on his journey. Despite her determination, Ryo remains steadfast in his decision, apologizing to her while acknowledging the pain he's causing. When the time comes, Ryo bids farewell to Yuba, Ruri, and the villagers before setting off on his journey alone. At the village's exit, Sio waits for him, finally coming to terms with his departure. They say their goodbyes and promise to meet again someday. Continuing on his journey, Ryo makes a stop at the forest village, where he reunites with Latifa and the other demi-humans. Embracing the warm welcome, Ryo decides to stay in the village for a few months. During his stay, Ryo comes up with a brilliant idea to build a mobile house that he can carry in his space-time storage device. Dominic, impressed by the idea, offers to build the house for him. One day, Ryo wakes up to find a strange, naked pink-haired girl lying beside him in his bed. The girl reveals herself as a spirit who made a contract with him but has no recollection of their past or even her name. As they communicate telepathically, Ryo promises not to disclose anything about his past life to anyone. He decides to name the spirit girl Asia, after beautiful springtime in the Beast People's language. Asia then uses her spirit magic to create a dress for herself. When Ryo sees her, memories of Mahero, his childhood friend when he was Haruto, flood his mind. Surprisingly, Asia reveals that she excels in all elements of spirit magic, a rare and extraordinary talent. Despite this revelation, neither Ryo nor Dryas knows the reason for Asia's memory loss. While puzzled, they accept her into the village, and Asia's presence brings newfound joy and energy to the community. Ryo decides to challenge Ishia to a friendly sparring match. During their intense battle, Ryo utilizes all of his skills and magical attacks, but it becomes evident that they are evenly matched, as Ishia adeptly counters every one of his moves, mirroring his fighting techniques flawlessly. After their spirited duel, Dryas takes it upon herself to become Ishia's mentor, imparting her extensive knowledge about spirits to the eager young spirit girl. As days pass, Ishia becomes more and more accustomed to her life in the forest village. Eventually, Dominic completes the construction of Ryo's mobile house. Surya reveals that he will be leaving the village in two days, and before he departs, the village elders bestow gifts upon him. This time, Ursula gives him a teleportation device, allowing him to easily return to the village whenever he wishes. Sildora gifts him earrings that grant him the ability to change his hair color and disguise himself. With heartfelt farewells, Ryo embarks on his journey with Ishia as his companion. Before returning to the land where he grew up, Ryo takes a detour and decides to visit Celia in the kingdom of Beltram. To avoid recognition, Ryo changes the color of his hair, skillfully maintaining a low profile with his clever disguise. Alongside Ishia, he visits a bakery where they overhear people discussing news about a noble's upcoming wedding parade scheduled for the following day. Under the cover of night, Ryo and Ishia clandestinely infiltrate the Royal Academy where Celia serves as a teacher. With finesse, they manage to elude the guards, silently making their way to Celia's lab. 
However, to their shock and dismay, they discover that the room is empty, just as Ryo had left it. Desperate for answers, Ryo and Ishia leave the lab and encounter other teachers. Ishia uses her spirit magic to hypnotize one of them, and under her spell, the man reveals the unexpected news that Celia is getting married to Charles, a member of the Royal Guard. Ryo, while he was away, receives distressing news that the Kingdom of Beltram suffered a significant defeat at the hands of the Praxia Empire. The man he hypnotized reveals that Charles initiated peace negotiations with the Praxia Empire after the royal family of Beltram lost its power due to the Hubenant family's flight from the capital. To secure more power, the House of Arbor arranged a political marriage between the House of Clare and Charles. Hearing this, Rio suspects that Celia might be coerced into the marriage and decides to confront her. Meanwhile, in her room, Celia resigns herself to her fate and prepares to become Charles' property upon marriage. She believes she has no choice and is willing to proceed with the marriage to protect her family. While looking at a letter Rio sent her long ago, Celia still holds feelings for him and wishes to see him one more time. Rio manages to sneak into the Royal Academy and finds his way to Celia's room, surprising her after four years of separation. Celia struggles to maintain her composure, and Rio is more concerned about her happiness in the upcoming marriage with Charles. Celia insists she is content with the arrangements, but Rio senses that something is amiss. Before he can elaborate, Celia asks him to leave to avoid any trouble or rumors. After Rio departs, Celia breaks down in tears in her room. The following day, the wedding preparations are in full swing, and Charles introduces Celia to his six other wives, who treat her with disdain as she will be the lowest ranked among them. Princess Christina, who sympathizes with Celia's forced marriage, takes her aside to speak privately. Christina reveals that when Duke fled the kingdom, he kidnapped Princess Flora, leading to the Beltran family's loss of respect and power. Christina promises to do anything she can to help Celia whenever the opportunity arises. The wedding parade commences, and the crowds gather to watch. Disguised, Asia and Rio are among the onlookers. As Charles extends his hand to Celia, she recalls her conversation with Rio the previous night, where she dreamt of a different life with him in a distant land. Feeling defeated, she reluctantly takes Charles' hand, believing she will soon be nothing more than a puppet. Suddenly, they hear shouts from the guards to halt. Rio, in disguise, rushes toward the wedding coach. The guards attempt to stop him with a human blockade, but he effortlessly breaks through with a powerful wind attack. The mage squad also tries to restrain him with photon bullets, but Rio evades their attacks with grace and agility. Rio finally reaches the coach, but Charles' elite squad stands in his way. Celia becomes worried, but Charles reassures her, claiming confidence in the squad and referring to the upcoming fight as a show before the ceremony. As Charles brags about his guards, he quickly stops when he witnesses Rio effortlessly defeating them. Still dazed by Rio's abilities, Charles watches as Rio lands a heavy punch on him, causing Charles to fall unconscious. With Charles incapacitated, Rio grabs Celia and holds a knife to her neck, putting on a show for everyone present. The onlookers become enraged, but Rio telepathically communicates with Celia, assuring her that he won't harm her. He reveals that he knows she's not willing to go through with the wedding and asks her if she truly wants to proceed. Rio is determined not to lose someone important to him, drawing strength from memories of his mother. At first, Celia is hesitant, but Rio persuades her to admit her true feelings. She confesses that she wants him to end the wedding and take her away. Hearing her confession, Rio immediately acts on the plan and kidnaps Celia, instructing her to play along with the act. Carrying her in his arms, Rio runs away, pursued by the guards and mages. In the dark alley, Rio hands Celia over to Asia, who plans to escape the royal capital with her and meet up with Rio later at a rendezvous point. Meanwhile, Rio returns to the streets to face off against all the guards, skillfully avoiding lethal force. Alfred, the strongest knight in the kingdom, emerges to challenge Rio with a magic-coated sword. Rio and Alfred engage in a fierce battle, with Rio blocking and dodging Alfred's powerful attacks. Alfred attempts to overpower Rio with a spell-infused attack, but when the dust settles, Rio is nowhere to be found. Alfred orders his men to search for him, while Rio meets up with the girls at the arranged location outside the capital. As they rendezvous, Celia expresses her gratitude to Rio for saving her. Suddenly, a thunderstorm brews, and massive beams of magical light descend from the sky to the ground, appearing all over the land. Asia quickly senses that something is amiss and urges Rio to assist someone in need. Meanwhile, a boy and two girls find themselves lost and are subsequently kidnapped by bandits, transported to another world. Fortunately, Rio intervenes just in time, rescuing them from the bandits. To his surprise, one of the individuals he saves turns out to be Naru, but she fails to recognize him. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe our channel, Annie Explainer. See you in the next video.